Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I have the best job ever. I do one-on-one angel sessions, which are wonderful. I offer soul mentoring that allows for ongoing support as you move through a time of transformation or growth. And I also offer a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And I offer a new class every six weeks or so. I like to mix it up. My classes are typically small in size, anywhere between four to 10 people. So if you do decide to register for one of my classes, be assured you will have a lot of space and time to connect and receive. And you can learn all about all of my offerings, including my current classes at my website, illuminatingsouls.com, where you can also sign up for my mailing list And then you'll be in the know of everything I have going on. But for now, the angels and I, we are here to help you come into a lovely state of rest and create sanctuary to make it easier for you to connect with the divine love your angels are bringing to you. This podcast is an unlikely mashup of two of my favorite forms of self-care that I lean into just about every single day. The first is the angels. I love living life knowing that I am divinely supported and loved and also knowing That if this is true for me, it is true for you as well. And I also listen to a sleep podcast every single night to help me drift off to sleep. And that is why I've created this podcast for you. I love having a lot of different kinds of of podcasts and episodes to choose from when I'm getting ready to go to bed. And so I thought, you know, I want to create one to add to the inventory that's out there. Inventory just doesn't sound like the right word, but it's the one that comes forward right now. So if you are new to the podcast and contemplating what this might feel like to use this to help you sleep, let me give you a few suggestions. I like to turn the volume down low, lower than I would if I'm listening to an audio book. Because almost always when I am listening to an audio book, I want to hear everything. I want to pay attention because there's a story or a narrative happening that I really want to pay attention to. A sleep podcast is really intended to be something you can sort of tune into and then Just let it go in the background. It's funny. I'm listening to the Sleepy Bookshelf right now. And I love that podcast. It's a great option for a sleep podcast if you're looking for other things you can listen to. And the host, Elizabeth, reads an entirety of a book over many episodes So sometimes she reads a book that I'm not all that interested in. Other times I'm enchanted and I'm grateful to listen to the book. She's read Jane Eyre, Pride and Prejudice, Little Women, 
Anne of Green Gables, which if you listen to this podcast, you know how much I love that book. And right now she's reading Enchanted April. I think it's, that's what it's called. I actually just looked it up. (laughs) It's called The Enchanted April. I knew that it was a movie a while back, which I hadn't seen. And so I've never read the book and I'm listening to it for the first time. It's a lovely book and I typically don't make it further than about 10 or 15 minutes in before I go to sleep. (laughs) And so I've been listening to episode five. I think I'm on my fifth listen to, (laughs) to it. And I just keep forwarding to the part that I remember and then I pick up there. It really is just a very sweet way to drift off to sleep. And so I'm hoping that this podcast will be that for you as well. And I'll also say many of you have shared with me that you love listening during the day because you enjoy my stories and connecting with the angels. And so whether you are a daytime or nighttime listener, whether you're listening to go to sleep or you're listening because you are allowing me the great privilege of keeping you company. I am grateful you are here. You, my friend, are a blessing in this world. And the world is better because of you. So let's circle back to this concept of divine love that I started talking about a few minutes ago. Because I feel like we all need this reminder. I certainly do. And this is the work that I have devoted my life to. I don't always remember that divine love and the angels are available to me. I really live in a duality. You know, we are divine beings having a human experience. And sometimes we are very, very, very human. (laughs) And that is all I can orient to on some days. I am confused or I'm overwhelmed. And I forget that I can ask the angels for help. Listen, intellectually, I know that I can ask for help. But sometimes when I'm in the middle of it, I forget I can outsource Like, hey, angels, can you help me with this? And so this concept of divine love and divine support, it is always available to us. We just don't always remember we can tune into it. And I just have to insert a little listening note here. I am recording this in the early morning and the birds are singing not my personal birds, the birds that live out in our neighborhood and our trees. So if you hear bird song, it is because it is here. <laughs> a lovely, a lovely messenger for us. So when I'm in it, when I'm in the weeds of being a human being, being earth girl, Laurel, I often don't remember to call in the angels for help. It is a good thing I do this work, though, because most weekdays I'm doing either an angel session or teaching or writing or some form of interaction with the angels, and they bring me back to center. So one of the ways to contemplate it is, and you know, this is a metaphor that I don't know will stand the test of time, but it will, I think, for all of us listening. If you're listening to this, you likely grew up listening to the radio, right? I don't know how many of you remember when we had five presets on the car and you got to decide which radio stations were going to be on your presets in your car so you could just push the button and listen to the next station. You know, now with Spotify and everything else, we get to set up our own I say we get to set up our own playlists. I don't really do that. I am old school still. (laughs) I know 
have shifted to listening to audiobooks in the car, but I digress back to this metaphor of radio stations. So back in the day, and they still are playing, but a radio station is broadcasting whether you listen to it or not. So there were many different radio stations and still are radio stations that I do not listen to. That does not mean that they don't exist or aren't broadcasting. And to listen to it, you just have to tune into it. And that's the metaphor that I love to use for divine wisdom, guidance, love, and the angels. It's always there. We just have to tune our dial so that we can receive it. One of the best ways I know to do this is to use the imagination because the imagination and the place where divine guidance come in overlap a little bit, not completely, but because there's enough of an overlap, we can often use the imagination to jumpstart our way into divine guidance. And it's to imagine the most loving supportive, compassionate, light-filled presence and voice you can imagine that is filled with love for you. And when you begin imagining, reaching, attuning to that presence, it makes it so much easier for your angels to connect with you. And you can also ask the angels for help. Just so you know, this will not be the only time in the history of this podcast I remind you of this because we have a tendency to forget. I do for sure. And I work with the angels all the time. So you can ask the angels for help. And when you do, you are not taking them from something more important. It's like, wanting to go and use a little bit of the sun and worrying that you are going to take too much sun and someone else will not have enough. How can God's love and God's resourcefulness be any less abundant and available than sunlight? I love that metaphor. Every time I say it, I get so happy. I'm like, that makes so much sense. (laughs) So my friends, I'm going to call the angels in. They're already here, but I'm going to call them in so that you know they are here too. So I invite you to get comfortable in whatever way works best for you. And if you are preparing for bed, to cozy on up and snuggle on in. Right now we are in a weather transition, a seasonal transition here in the Bay Area. And we have gone from it being very cold at night to it being a little bit milder. And I know many people prefer warmer weather. I prefer cooler weather, but not cold weather, because I like to sleep with a lot of blankets and This is that time of year when I have to start peeling off the extra blankets and I get so sad. (laughs) I'm down to one light extra blanket right now, but that is about to go away as we get into the warmer weather here. So as I say to you to cozy on up and snuggle on in, I want to acknowledge that you too may be going through some shifts in the bedding that you are using and how you prepare for sleep as we move through our seasonal changes wherever you are. And to take some nice deep breaths in as we gently call ourselves forward into the heart of God. And beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here and I welcome your presence 
as we open to the divine love that is streaming to each of our beloveds listening now. Angels, I ask that you bring in a lightness of spirit. That you help lift and clear from us anything that is feeling like a burden. To help clear away that which feels hard. To bring in a greater sense of ease and co-creation with the universe. And angels, I ask that you bring in healing light and service to each of our highest and best goods. And dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in. And the angels are infusing the space you are in with a beautiful soft pink light that has been calibrated with love just for you. And this light can easily and gracefully expand to all of those you love, whether they are in your household or far away. So you can ask the angels to send this light to those in your heart. And just breathe. And if you have any prayers or intentions or requests that you would like to share with the angels, I invite you to bring them into your heart and share them in consciousness. And your angels are here and they are listening. They are receiving your requests and breathe. And I'll share with you something that is coming forward for me that I want to put out there. And I share it with you because you feel free to say yes, yes to this that I am invoking and asking for. So angels, angels, I ask for your assistance and support to make this adventure, this journey, this experience lighthearted, easy, graceful, fun. Let this be even easier than I could have ever imagined. I ask that you open to my creative spirit and allow me to serve as a vessel, a channel of light and joy and inspiration. I ask that you help me get out of my own way, (laughs) especially when I am being stubborn and I cannot see the forest for the trees. Angels, I ask that you open my heart to the wellspring of love that is here I ask that you bring to me beautiful, beautiful adventures and joy and opportunities that feel vibrant and filled with love. And again, I ask for great ease, joy, co-creation that flows so beautifully from one breath to the next knowing that I am being supported and held. This journey is beautiful. It is bright and true. And I feel so wonderfully on purpose each and every day. I am co-creating with the angels and with the beautiful, vibrant universe. Thank you, God, for the gift of this life. Thank you, God, for this moment. Thank you, God, for all who are sharing in this prayer. And my friends, just take a deep breath in. And if anything I have said is resonating for you, just say, yes, me too. (laughs) Count me in. Because a prayer for one is a prayer for all. So here's the opening to graceful co-creation, to getting out of our own ways and allowing our creative spirit, our joy, our life force to flow through us in ways 
that are delightful and joyful and easy and fun. I'm ready for fun for sure. (laughs) And so I share this with you. I share this prayer and this request with you and for you. And we ask that only that which is for the highest and best transpire. And so it is. Amen. And breathe. And how does that feel for you? I always ask that in my sessions. How does that feel? I know for me, I feel more joy. I feel more hopeful. I feel enthusiastic. I'm excited. And there is something to be said about sharing our prayers, our intentions, our requests with the divine. Because our energy is amplified. And so breathe, breathe it all in. And your angels are cheering you on, as am I. I'm cheering you on. You're wonderful, and I'm excited for for you and all the adventures that are singing your name. And so, my beautiful friend, you go ahead and you get comfortable. And if it's time for you to drift off to rest, you go ahead and do just that, and your angels will stay with you. And I'm going to tell you some stories. So notice how I said I'm going to tell you some stories. First, just a little bit of a detour to share with you about how I record and create these episodes. So there are different kinds of episodes I make for you. For me too, because I listen to my own podcast. There are times that I read to you, like I read to you about Anne of Green Gables. Or I might flip through an old magazine, like the TV Guide or something published at the turn of the century. And I might give you a little editorial while I read to you different articles and snippets. And then there are the ones where I tell you stories from my own life. I love making all of them for you. And each of them has their own appeal to me when I get ready to record. So there's one episode that I am going to be making for you soon where I'm going to read some old articles about a time in history that I'm fascinated by. The thing about those episodes is they take a little more energy and time for me because I have to find the right articles. And then I always make mistakes when I'm reading. You can't, I can't, I should say, maybe you can but I can't read out loud for an extended period of time and not make mistakes. So I go back and I re-record it and then I have to find the different articles and then editing it takes more time because there are more things that I need to edit. So it's not hard. I don't want to make this sound like it's a hardship. It really isn't. It's so easy, but it just takes a different muscle for me to record those episodes. The easiest ones for me to do are when I share with you stories from my life because I basically just share a stream of consciousness. So typically, very little editing is needed. There are some times that I re-record a little aspect of it or there's a noise outside and I re-record something. Those are the easiest episodes for me to create though, but I also have to have a story to share with you and they're not always quite top of mind. And I want to make sure I don't use up all my stories because I'd like this podcast to run for a really long time. (laughs) So I woke up this morning thinking I was going to record the episode about the historical pieces I wanted to read to you. Only I sat down here and I thought, oh, I don't want to do that. (laughs) I really wish the episode was already recorded because I think it's going to be a great episode, but it just takes a different muscle than I want to use today. So I thought, I want to tell stories today. What can I share with you about? 
And so this is where we get what story time is going to be about in this episode. So this is going to be randoms. I used to belong to an online community long before social media. And one of the things they would do is they would have randoms. They would encourage us to share like five random things from our lives. It's a wonderful exercise. If you're ever looking for an icebreaker, invite people to share five random things from their life because it doesn't have to be your resume. It's not this question like, what do you do for a living? Where did you grow up? It, it can be completely random things. And I often use this in my classes. So if any of you are going to be taking the, my new class, The Power of Your Voice, which may not be new by the time you listen to it, it could have happened two years ago, but as of this moment, it is imminent. This is a great question I love to ask to help people get their voice out. So I'm going to be sharing with you random memories that I have from growing up in Skokie, Illinois. I could have just called this memories of Skokie, but then I would feel this responsibility to really share with you all about Skokie. And I don't know that I'm going to do that, but I felt like, you know, what I can do is I can share with you a bunch of random memories and that sounded like fun to me. Hence, this is what story time is going to be in this episode. A little snippet of my creative process in how I approach these episodes. It has to be fun for me, otherwise I don't want to show up. And that's basically my rule for life. If it's not fun and it feels like a chore, I'm not going to do it. So I'm always looking for ways to make things joyful and fulfilling. And so, so here we go. We're going to go into the way back machine and you're going to visit with me as little Laurel in Skokie, Illinois in the sixties and seventies, maybe early eighties. I don't know how many memories are going to show up, but I left Skokie. I moved to Los Angeles in 1985. So I lived there from 1962 to 1985. So that will be the pool of random memories that I will be selecting from. So if you listen to this podcast, you have likely heard me talk about Skokie before, but if you have not, Skokie, Illinois is a suburb of Chicago. And Skokie it was very safe when I grew up there. I feel like I had a rather idyllic childhood. It, and I had hardship in, in childhood as well. I don't want to make it sound like everything was beautiful. But when I look at what life today is like for children, I think, God, we kind of had a good. We used to be able to play outside for as long as we wanted. We didn't have to have parental supervision. Most of the moms on our block were stay-at-home moms, and so there was always a parent around with an earshot, but it wasn't the kind of thing where we had to be highly supervised. So I also grew up with a sense of independence and adventure. I wasn't afraid to go off somewhere with a friend or on my own. In Skokie also, they had a really great park district. So they had a big swimming pool, Oakton Pool, where we would spend our summers. They also had two different JCCs, which are Jewish Community Centers, which is the Jewish version of the YMCA, where we also used to take all kinds of classes. They had an indoor swimming pool at one of the JCCs, and so I used to take swimming lessons there. At some point, they also built the Skadium, which was an indoor skating rink. And I took skating lessons. So let's start off with the Skadium and learning to skate. I should also say in terms of skating, Oakton Park would always freeze an outdoor rink as did our next door neighbors sometimes. 
The thing about outdoor rinks from my childhood memory is that they did not have the benefit of a Zamboni. (laughs) Do you know what a Zamboni is? I loved hockey for a while living in LA. I loved to go watch the Kings play and I love the Zamboni. It is this massive like monster truck piece of equipment. It looks like a street cleaner and it melts the ice on the front and it smooths the ice on the back and it puts new water down so that the ice is smooth. My experience of the outdoor rink at Oakton Park was that it was not smooth. There were lots of bumps and everybody else's skate marks and things like that. So it was kind of an adventure learning to skate on these things. Now, my memory of skating, again, this is just my own experience, was that it takes a lot of ankle strength which I have never had a lot. I mean, I have enough. I certainly can walk upright and, you know, (laughs) I can go for walks and things like that. But I haven't had the kind of ankle strength needed to be able to skate. Nor, I would say, the quad strength or the calf strength. I mean, that's all, you know, there's a lot of strength needed to be able to skate. It also requires something that I'm not great with, which is your center of balance. Again, I can stand upright and walk and all of those things. So my inner gyroscope works in that way. But I, for instance, I am not great at climbing up a hill. I'm not great at walking on rocks, you know, because that takes a certain kind of balance. My husband has the balance of a mountain goat. Me, not so much. Just as a little aside, there's this little stretch of of a waterway in Berkeley where there's a walking path and benches and then there's rocks leading down to this very narrow strip of beach. And when I would go there, all these people and their dogs and kids are walking down the rocks to get to the beach. I tried. I could not do it. I thought this is going to be bad. (laughs) Someone's going to have to rescue me. So I just share that with you because the way I relate inside of my body in terms of my center of gravity, it was not easy for me to learn to skate. Now here's the thing. I grew up watching the Olympics. My mom loved figure skating. So anytime ABC's wide world of sports was on and there was figure skating we were watching, right? I grew up in the age of Peggy Fleming. And the thing about figure skating, the ideal and the essence of it to make it look effortless. And this was the thing that always perplexed me about athletic ability. They have a body I have a body. I should be able to skate, (laughs) right? When you just see people effortlessly, I realize it's work. I'm just saying in a child's mind, they effortlessly glide across this ice and they twirl and they jump. I should be able to do that, right? So, I got signed up for skating lessons. I had my own skates, white skates with white laces and the skate guards and all of that. And I would go to the stadium for my skating lessons. They were group lessons. And I never found ease in skating. The thing that I could do is I could skate backwards. I don't know the aerodynamics of it, but it was easier for me to push off and skate backwards than it was to skate forwards. It took a different muscle. I don't know. Maybe it's like why it's easier for me to do the backstroke swimming than it is to do the front stroke. 
I, I'm not going to try and figure it out. I'm just saying that's how it was for me. The thing that was really, really hard was if we ever had to skate around the entire rink because that took a lot of effort to get all the way around the rink. But the thing was, is if I only got part of the way around the rink and I wanted to leave the rink, I either had to go around the whole perimeter of the rink, which I often opted for because I could hold on to the side because I was not a good skater, or I had to take my chances and skate across the center of the rink to get to the other side, and Lord knows I could fall. So I don't know why, I don't even know that this is of any interest to you, but it's a sleep podcast, so, but I was not a good skater, and I was not happy about that. I thought I should be able to. It's one of the things that I think when it's my time to go home to God, that I want to have a conversation about bodies. You know, that some bodies can skate. Other bodies, not so much. (laughs) So this body that I am in did not do well at skating, even though we had the skatium. And we also had the outdoor rink at Oakton Park. And my neighbors had a rink next door. And I had all these opportunities to skate. Did not really learn to skate. And I would never go on a pair of skates again because it would be a recipe for disaster. So this is my first random that I share with you about Skokie and growing up there. Which is about my endeavors as a child to learn to skate only to find out, not so good at that. Certainly not a natural. I could even have had many more lessons than I had, still wouldn't be good at it. So now when I see people figure skating, I'm like, wow, what an athlete. That's really hard. (laughs) But this also leads me to another childhood memory. And the theme that bridges these two memories has to do with me not understanding my body and why my body was not the same as other bodies. And this memory has to do with watching Bozo Circus. Now, I don't know if Bozo Circus existed across the country in the U.S. here so that other people grew up with the local production of Bozo Circus, but Bozo Circus in Chicago was the show in childhood. It aired on WGN Channel 9 at 12 noon every day, Monday through Friday. They had a live audience of children and their parents, and you had to wait like 10 years to get a ticket. I mean, it was rare that you knew someone who got to go to a taping of Bozo's Circus. It was taped live, I think. What do I know? I'm a kid. I seem to recall it was live. Maybe it was recorded. I don't know. It was the 60s. And so the announcer would come on, Bozo Circus is on the air. And then it would play the circus music and Bozo would come out. He was a clown with big red hair and giant feet and a red nose. And there were also other clowns like Cookie the Clown. So... First, let me share with you about why I'm relating this to the Skadium story, which is back in the 60s and maybe early 70s, acrobats were a big thing. Ed Sullivan had acrobats. Bozo Circus had acrobats. Quite often on Bozo Circus, they would have child acrobats And I seem to recall many of them were from China. I don't know why I remember that, but that's my memory of it. And so these little girls would come out, probably around my age, and they would be able to do things like these back bends off of platforms to sip water from a straw. (laughs) This is what I remember. They would be on this platform 
and they would start doing this back bend, and then they would reach their neck down, and there would be a straw and a glass of water, and they would drink the water in a back bend off a platform. Now, listen, for a five or six year old girl, this is a life goal, right? <laughs> this is this is a life's goal. I want to be able to do a back bend off a platform and dip my head down below my feet and drink water out of a straw. Life goal for sure. However, as a child, I did not know that these girls had been training their entire lives for this moment. I was so disappointed that I could not do an unassisted back bend. I could not go from a standing position into a back bend. I know some people could do that. I could not. I could do a bridge, which was different. What a bridge was is you start flat on the floor, you bring your feet up to your butt, and you put your hands behind your head, and then you push up with your feet in your hands, and you kind of do a bridge with your tummy. I could do a bridge. I could not do a back bend. And then I thought, well, maybe I could do the bridge and suck the water out of a glass with a straw. Oh, no. No, I could not do that either. So I was very confused about why my body did not bend the way these girls' bodies did. They also did other things, but the thing that I really remember is the straw trick because... I was fascinated by that. I was like, how cool is that? I could just drink water out of a straw in a back bend. I was enchanted by these girls. So every time the acrobats were on, I was riveted. And then I would try and do whatever they had just done. And of course I could not. I'd already shared with you about when I was trying to teach myself to do a headstand as a little girl. That was the extent of my achievement. I finally learned how to do a headstand. And that was my big trick. I could do a headstand and stay in a headstand for quite a long time without assistance or without a wall behind me. But that was really the extent of my acrobatic prowess. So between the skatium and not being able to skate and the Chinese acrobats and not being able to to drink out of a back bend, I was pretty disillusioned with what I was able to do in my body as Laurel. So a moment of silence for that. I don't know if any of you had those experiences. Oh, wait, I need to share with you the other thing that disappointed me about my physical ability. I was going to say agility, but I have none. So there you go. Horseback riding. How many of you as a child thought, especially if you did not grow up around horses, that once you got on horseback, you would just know how to ride, right? I, I, I watched all of these I don't, I don't know that we watched Westerns, but there was lots of evidence of people know how to ride horses on my television screen. Plus all the books I read as a kid about girls and their horses. And I loved horses, even though I hadn't really met any of them because I lived in the suburbs. But I just knew, I just knew that when I got onto horseback, I would ride a horse because that's what you do. Not at all understanding that it is a skill set, once again, that I would not embody. <laughs> so there was a stable in Skokie, it might have been in Glenview, called Harms Wood Stable, I think. And so my mom and dad finally signed me up for horseback riding lessons. So it's an indoor, for the most part, indoor ring, I guess. And there's all these rules about horseback riding. You can ride English, which doesn't have the horn, or Western that does have the horn. And if you are a horseman or horsewoman, if you're a horseback rider, 
please forgive me. This is my memory of being an eight or nine year old, 10 year old girl learning to horseback ride. And in English style, I guess you have to post, which means you have to rise your body up in harmony with the horse when they trot, which is not easy or wasn't easy for me to do. And I found much to my dismay, I had no inherent grace when it came to horseback riding. Oh my God, I was disappointed because I had had many daydreams and fantasies about riding my horse across the open range, which did not exist in Skokie. I wouldn't even need a saddle. We would just know each other. We would know what each other wanted and needed. And I would be able to ride unhindered, uninhibited (laughs) across the Great Plains with my best friend, my horse, only to discover that that is not how it works, at least for me growing up in Skokie. First off, I never, ever mastered the art of getting up on the horse on my own, unassisted. I always needed someone to boost me up to get onto the horse. I didn't necessarily have the thigh strength to really learn how to work with a horse. And so that was another one of my Oh, disappointments of being in a physical body that did not work like other people's bodies. And I don't mean that to sound really sad. I think most people could not just get on a horse and ride. I just mean this disappointment that I somehow had this childlike sense of assuredness that if these people could skate around a rink, I could skate around a rink. If these acrobats can do a back bend, and drink water out of a bendy straw, I can do that too. If these people can ride across the open plain and gallop and not fall off, I can too. (laughs) Only to realize that this body had its own agenda. Like these were skills that had to be learned. And not all bodies would be able to achieve these things. Because also, if we're talking about skating, acrobats, horseback riding, what do all three of these things require to get good at them? Hard work and dedication. Now, I don't know if we've talked about this before. I know we have, but those were never the things I liked. I didn't want to work hard. I just wanted to know to do things. I also had piano lessons. My mother was a beautiful pianist. We had a piano in our house and she signed me up for piano lessons because I wanted to know how to play piano like my mother. Well, I don't know if you have any idea how much you have to practice and learn to become a pianist. So I took these piano lessons and I had to play scales and do stupid kid songs And I needed to practice, which I never, ever did. I'm very stubborn and I have always been stubborn. And my mom would say, you need to practice the piano. And I would give her some sort of horrible eye roll. I go, I know, I'll do it later. (laughs) And I never did. And I remember going to my piano lesson, this lovely woman somewhere in downtown Skokie. And she would get so frustrated with me. She'd be like, you haven't practiced because I clearly had not made any progress from week to week. And I'd be like, I know. And and at some point, I think she said to me and my mom, there's no point in bringing her for lessons if she's not going to practice. And so at some point that stopped. I also had a flute and that was the instrument I had chosen to play in school because I was in band, never practiced, just barely got along. I'm sure I was a terrible flute player. Guitar, I had guitar lessons, 
because I wanted to learn to play guitar, never practiced. So there's a theme. I didn't even know this theme was going to come through in this session. I thought I was just going to do randoms about Skokie. But instead, it has been randoms <laughs> about the desires in childhood to be able to do things really well, only to realize that they required a lot of hard work, which I was not up for. And maybe I wasn't wired for. Listen, I think I could have probably had skating lessons for hours a day, and I would not have been good at it. I'm telling you, my center of gravity and my ankle, calf, thigh strength as a child was not well honed, and I don't know that I was ever going to be somebody who could skate very well. I mean, same thing as for an acrobat. I, I There's no universe in which I have the body archetype to be a good acrobat. As for horseback riding, maybe I could have gotten good at it. But I really have never liked that time of not being good at something I want to be good at. Isn't that interesting? Abraham Hicks calls the, the time between the dream, the desire, and the realization of it, the gap of creation. Like, I'll take time to learn things. If there's a, a, a computer program like Photoshop that I want to learn, I will learn it because I get very stubborn about knowing something. But especially those things that have had to do with my body, I, I'm not interested I think just between you and me and the angels, I've always resisted having a body. Like I know I have to have one because otherwise I don't get to be here on earth. But this whole idea of having a body, especially in childhood, was hard for me. I mean, I didn't have that level of consciousness to realize what that conversation was, but... I was like, why does my body not do things that other people's bodies do? So, you know what's interesting? Is I have not gotten to half of the things on my list. I, there were more Bozo Circus stories I wanted to share with you. Okay, you know what? I'm going to share this Bozo Circus story with you. And then I'm going to save the other things on my list for another podcast. But... I don't know that I'll ever talk about Bozo Circus again. And so this does not weave into the things about my body, but this is its own standalone Bozo Circus random. <laughs> so here we go. So the huge thing that they did every single day on Bozo Circus was the grand prize game. I say it that way because that's how they would say it. It's time for the grand prize game. And all the kids would go crazy. And then they would pick two kids out of the audience. And the way they would do this is the camera person. I'm sure it was a cameraman. I don't know that they camera women back then. And they were these huge, the cam cameras, the TV cameras back then were enormous. I know this because I studied television in the 80s and the cameras were enormous then. So I can only imagine how big they were in the 60s. And they would jiggle it on its stand. And there would be these arrows projected onto the screen. And they would play this music. And then wherever the arrows would land, the way the camera was jiggling, whoever it landed on would get to play the game. They would pick one boy and one girl. So first off, to get tickets to go see Bozo Circus took like 10 years. Or you needed to know someone. To get picked for the grand prize game was a childhood equivalent of a winning lottery ticket. Rarely happened, and I don't know that I ever knew anyone who got to play the grand prize game, but it was the pinnacle of achievement in childhood. And here's what the grand prize game was. They had six buckets. Each was a foot apart, and the buckets I think that what they looked like to me was, if you ever remember going to Baskin Robbins and they had those five gallon buckets, 
They were like the five gallon buckets from Baskin and Robbins, but they didn't have the ice cream residue on them. And they were a foot apart. So there was a straight line of these buckets. And then there was a ping pong ball, or I think it was a ping pong ball. And the child had to get the ball in each bucket. And each time you got the ball in the bucket, you got a prize. And the prizes got better the further up the line you got. Sort of like the Hanukkah present theme. First night, you might get a really good present. Last night, we would get a really good present. Everything in between was kind of filler. So I don't even remember what the prizes were, but, you know, first bucket, maybe you get a gift certificate or a game. You know, Cookie the Clown would come out holding up the game operation or something like that second bucket, you know, you get something else. And if you finally made it to bucket number six, which rarely happened, you got a bicycle or something, you know, some big prize. So we loved the grand prize game. And I know, I know we did it at home. And I think other kids, moms probably did this too. I say moms because I don't know that dads were really involved in birthday party planning back then. But the thing was to go to Baskin Robbins, ask if you could have six of the empty buckets because, you know, they didn't need them anymore. We weren't really into recycling back then, so they were probably happy just to give them away. You'd have to wash, of course, the ice cream residue off of them. And then we would set up the grand prize game. Now, this is going to be really cool what I'm going to do next because I'm going to weave this into a spiritual principle for you. Who knew? Bozo Circus, Grand Prize Game, Spiritual Principle. I love to weave together spiritual principles for you. So, at the University of Santa Monica, because again, all roads lead back there at some point when I'm talking about spiritual principles, the first weekend, they set up a ring toss game. Kind of similar to the grand prize game that I have just shared with you about. There's one pole at the three foot mark, one at the six foot mark, and one at the 12 foot mark. And we would get three rings. The goal is to get to 12 points. That's all they told us. So we had to then discern what our strategy was going to be. Some people said, well, Oh, no, they had four rings. Yes. Oh, sorry. They had four rings because the goal was to get to 12 points. So some people decided just to take their four rings to put on the three foot pole. It was three feet away from them. And for most people, you can just lean over and put it onto the three foot pole. Some people decided I'll try two on six and what, like there were different combinations we were going to do. I decided I was going to mix it up a little bit because that's the kind of girl I am. I like to mix things up. But here's, here's why they were doing this for us. And not all of us had to go. We sort of went into groups, like strategy groups. And here's what was discerned. The people who decided to just go for the three foot toss. It's like the first bucket on Bozo Circus. They made it 100% of the time. Whereas the people who were trying to go for the 12 points and maybe they could get to 24, even though we were not told that that was the goal, they didn't always make it. And so at USM, they often talk about the three foot toss. That often when we are co-creating We might try to go for the 12 foot toss or the 24 foot toss. And then we miss because we don't make it. It's like if you could either get bucket number six on the grand prize, you get a bicycle. But what if you make it into bucket number one six times, you get the bicycle what would your strategy be? So I just needed to weave those together. 
you are likely not impressed by my prowess at building the bridge between Bozo Circus and the spiritual principle, but I'm rather delighted at the moment to see how this bridge from childhood of the grand prize game segues into three-foot tosses. And I have really embraced this concept of three-foot tosses when it comes to co-creation because I have a tendency to overcomplicate things. So it helps me to say, what would be a three-foot toss here? And the thing about three-foot tosses is they change from day to day. If I have a lot of energy and I'm excited about things, something could feel like a three-foot toss, but if I'm tired the next day, it could feel like a 12-foot toss. So, so it's mutable. It's not it's not always the same. So you know how earlier in the episode we were asking the angels for help to help make things easy and graceful? My invitation to you is to ask for clarity on some three-foot tosses in the direction of whatever dreams are singing to your heart. What could be some super easy, doable, intentional actions that you can take in service to a heartfelt dream. And that, my friends, will complete this episode (laughs) of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings with my weird randoms that I didn't even know were going to get strung together this way. I thought I was going to be sharing with you more about Skokie, including our wonderful access to bagels and bialis, but that will have to be its own episode. For now, though, this is what my heart wants to share with you. I send you so much love. And here's to all of our childhood experiences. Oh, and as we learned, like, where our gifts lie and perhaps where they don't, right? I was not going to be a skater or a Chinese acrobat (laughs) or a horseback rider. And I never got a chance to go to Bozo Circus or play the grand prize game, but I did get a version of the grand prize game in my basement for a birthday party, but nobody got a bike, right? The presents had to be much less than, um, you know, they had to be more available for my parents to get for the kids, but still it was fun. So here's to our lovely childhood dreams and experiences and how they've alchemized within us as we move through our lives. I'm so grateful for you. I wish our inner children could go and we could play the grand prize game together. And I would put cool prizes in the buckets for you. So we'll just do that on the astral realm. Well, the angels and the fairies set that up for us. It'll be a lot of fun. (laughs) So I wish you the sweetest of dreams. I wish you a good rest. I wish you love. I wish you joy. I wish you goodness. So thank you for spending this time with me. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. I love you. Thank you.